This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. And do us a favor if you like the pod, you love what we do here, go over to Prize Picks. Sign up using that code again, CLNS. It will help us tremendously. All right, Greg, let's start about with some uh, big NFL news. Came out yesterday. Stephon Diggs got traded from Buffalo to Houston. Just your uh, initial reaction to that trade when you saw it. My initial reaction in seeing that the Bills took, um, I think it was $31 million um, in terms of a cap hit this year. Didn't even do the June 1st uh, designation to split it out over two years. Um, To me, that told me that the Bills wanted out of the Stefan Diggs business, that they were sick of his act sick of um, his little sort of comments here and there, whether it's about Josh Allen or about some of the teammates or about the Bills in general, Um, and that this is now the second team, including the Vikings, that were just like, yeah, I love the guy, very talented, but uh, yeah, we don't really want him around here anymore in this team environment. So that was my initial impression, and and I will also say that um, in terms of the player and where he is in his career, um, to me, I saw a pl- player that, for whatever reason, and it could have been attitude, it could have been he didn't like Sean McDermott or didn't like his off- offensive coordinator, the changes that they I don't know. But I saw a player in the second half of the season that was in decline, that was not playing well, that was not much of a factor anymore. Now, I'm not saying he's done or anything like that, but I just don't think that, you know, um, people have to be careful about like attaching just falling in love with the name instead of the actual film and production. And to me, Stefan Diggs was no longer Stefan Diggs. Um, he was a lesser version. He's got a lot, a lot of miles on him. He's going to be 31 this year. And, but I do think it's a good move for the Texans. I think he's the type of guy, a veteran guy can get open at least in the short term for a year or two uh, can help, a young offense, a young quarterback, but for where the Bills were, I understand their decision. Yeah, I mean, when when I looked at this deal, I first thought of our conversation going back a month and a half ago, two months ago, about how Houston could be a blueprint for the Patriots. And this idea of, hey, you've got the third pick in the draft this year, you could draft your future quarterback, your franchise face for the next 10 to 15 Not saying that Drake May, Jaden Daniels, whoever it is for the Patriots will end up being as good as C.J. Stroud. Just the idea of landing your franchise quarterback with that top three pick. And you look at how they handled free agency the last couple of years. I think the Patriots could follow a very similar path. And then maybe, you know, next year would be the year to have that big swing and not necessarily this year to make that kind of a trade. That's the first thought I had. Then, Then I started to think about Josh Allen. And Gabe Davis is gone. Diggs is gone. How will that change the offense for the Buffalo Bills, which we'll get into in a little bit? But I started to think, well, the pressure's now on Josh because Josh uh, needs to really come through without his his security blanket. And, you know, how will he look if things are going great early on because of such a dramatic change? Should the Patriots, Greg, have been involved here? No, no, I, I completely agree with you. The Patriots are not in a place yet to do this type of deal. Um, could they, provided they take a quarterback at three and he shows some promise and the team's competitive and, you know, could they do it at, say, the trade deadline? Yeah, it's possible. But I think it's more likely that, say, the, the Patriots follow the Texans' plan and they're pretty competitive. They're around 500 this year. Um, they draft a couple, one or two draft wide receivers and – there's some promise there, but maybe they're not sure whether they're going to be quite ready to deliver. Then, yeah, you make the Stefan Diggs move next offseason. But where the Patriots are now to bring in um, a look, a diva wide receiver, no. It, it makes zero sense for the Patriots to do it. Um, just look at just look at what and, and look, Devontae Adams, um, I don't think anybody would call him a diva, but you know, when you're when you're a wide receiver who gets a lot of media attention, who gets paid a lot of money, who the team gives up a lot of uh, capital 
whether it's draft and or money, and you're that guy, every after every game in the locker room, if you don't catch more than three balls, like people are asking, like, why didn't you touch the ball? And like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you invite all this stuff. Just look at the Raiders and Josh McDaniels. I mean, I think we all thought it was a really good move. Devontae Adams, Carr, former college teammates. It made sense. But to me, that just reinforced you do not bring in that sort of alpha, top flight, diva-ish wide receiver until you're damn sure about the quarterback because it's going to overshadow everything and be a problem. And so where the Patriots are right now, it made zero sense for them to to go and get Stephon Diggs. Yeah. If the Bills even would have traded him in the division, which I highly doubt. Yeah, I would have been out. I mean, if if I were the Patriots and, and I was on the phone, I'd be out. I don't even know if I'd get on the phone. He's going to be 31 in November. And his, his attitude, Greg, as you mentioned, like he had run-ins in Minnesota. They got tired of him. Run-ins in Buffalo when they were contending. He got tired of them. They got tired of him. And he, he just kind of drums up drama for his quarterback. And, and I would not want that impacting the future of this franchise. Uh, if you draft May or Daniels or McCarthy or who, whoever you draft, I don't want that getting in the way of their development. And so – I just think he's a guy, you mentioned this, he did look like he took a step back last year. Maybe he'll be motivated. He'll have the chip on his shoulder to prove the world wrong and it'll be better this year. But I do think he took a step back. And the contract is outrageous. And you're going to end up handcuffing yourself for a number of years if you try to rework that deal. I do want to ask you a question, though, off of what you just said. You have been talking about the Patriots trading for a wide receiver at some point, whether it's right before the draft, during the draft, or after the draft. Should I take your comments on Diggs as you stepping back from that thought and thinking maybe they shouldn't pull the trigger on a deal like that just yet? Um, possibly, but I think I think the the Calvin Ridley pursuit tells us a lot that they that they viewed the roster and also what might happen in the draft and realized like if we just go to the draft, this is going to be a process. And do we have enough a wide receiver? In their opinion, going after aggressively Calvin Ridley, to me, that tells me that they see it the same way where, no, we need to get some sort of at least bridge guy at wide receiver. However, you know, these guys, and, and I think you've, you've talked about it, Nick, it, everything the Patriots have done pretty much, like they're getting younger guys. Like, you know, the Patriots are going to make a move. And look, Calvin Ridley's not young, but in terms of NFL football, he is because yeah. he basically had like a year and a half off. Yep. So he's more like, yeah, he's going to turn 30 this year, I think it is. He's more like a 27-year-old wide receiver in terms of mileage between the college game and the pro game. And so to me, the Patriots, I think they will still be looking for, you know, could it be T. Higgins, somebody like that? Yeah, it could be, um, depending on what the deal is and what kind of contract. But to, to me, the Patriots are doing this the right way. That they're not, they're not wasting their time with older bridge guys that might make them more competitive, more sexy this year. What they're looking for at just about every position is 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 a younger player with term that has a chance to grow in the system and give the Patriots a really good player. What's the deal with the Bills? Are they done? Uh, you know, good question. I was just looking at their, at their depth chart. Um, I think Nick, in my opinion, I think this is, I think a lot of teams, especially the teams who have the mega quarterback with the mega contract, I think they are, they looked at what the chiefs did last year, what the chiefs have done the past couple of years. I mean, they won back-to-back -back Super Bowls after trading Tyreek Hill, um, at the time, I'm sure if you polled most NFL fans when they traded Tyreek Hill, people would have been like 90% against it. Like, what the hell are you doing? I mean, yeah. you know, fantasy football. Like, Tyreek Hill's awesome. He's the best. He's fast. He's this and that. And guess what? The Chiefs go out and win two Super Bowls with, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster. And I don't even know what the hell they had last year. Uh, you know, oh, Rasheed Rice and, when, he's, when, he's not, uh, when he's not driving – allegedly when he's not street racing, he, he was out there. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, you even have to look at last year, like you could understand the first year because Travis Kelsey was like elite. 
He at least Patrick Mahomes had somebody who was elite around him that he could rely on. And he did that two years ago. Travis Kelsey this past year was not elite. He wasn't. He just, you know, I think it was injury. He got he got hurt very early on, I think, coming out of training camp. Um, was sort of never the same all year. But, you know, you look at it, and these teams are now saying they're going off the Chiefs' blueprint, which is if if we're paying you like a number one quarterback, then you need to ele- – same sort of the same thing that the Patriots did with Brady. You have to – we're relying – then again, Brady didn't get the mega contract, but um, same sort of thing where you we're paying you, you need to elevate these guys. And I think another component of this is I think that teams are now viewing what's coming out of the college game in terms of wide receivers. They're now almost viewing these guys like running backs where it's, you know, draft them, develop them, play them right away. They can play right away. And as soon as they they reach big money. We're just going to recycle through guys. So I would expect the Bills. Now, Gabe Davis, people people say, well, he also lost Gabe Davis. I, not, I'm not a Gabe Davis fan. I did not. I, I, I look at the Bills' decision and I say, this makes sense from a football perspective, that Gabe Davis wasn't that good. Stephon Diggs was in decline. And now the Bills are saying, we're just going to replace him with guys in the draft. Hopefully, we'll, be, we'll do better than we did with uh, Khalil Shakur. And, you know, who is a fifth round pick who hasn't really popped, but that's what they're going to do. And I think you're going to see a lot of teams do that. Same thing that the Packers have done with their young guys. They have all young guys who have been drafted and developed by the team, and that's the way they're going to go forward. Yeah, we'll see what they do in the draft. I would imagine that they'd at least entertain drafting a wide receiver at the end of the first round. I think they're at pick 28, if I remember correctly. They're towards the... uh, later portion of the first round. So maybe an A.D. Mitchell, maybe a Xavier Worthy, maybe a Xavier Leggett, maybe one of those guys they think they can grab and, and develop. But I think, you know, this is an offense that that went through a change last year. Ken Dorsey was fired. Joe Brady took over. They ran the football a little bit more. They used Josh Allen and his legs more than they had been earlier in the season. Cooks, uh, Cook played fantastic. Uh, so he's somebody who looks like he's going to be a thousand yard back. And mm-hmm. they got two young tight ends. They invested heavily in that position. So I wouldn't be surprised if they go a little bit more tight end heavy with their offense. So this is kind of a changing of the ways and, and going a little bit younger. AFC East, how would you slot the teams right now, Greg? Um, that's a real good question. I mean, everybody, the, the Bills and Dolphins definitely took some hits Yep. Um, in, in free agency. The Jets have added, but man... You know, I mean, that team is like a double ARP team and like, you know, <laughs> between, you know, Rogers and um, Tyron Smith and, you know, M- Mr. Glass, Mike Williams on the outside and let alone the other, you know, uh, other former Packers that they brought on board. Um, I think the AFC East is pretty shaky. Um, of course, a lot of this is going to depend on how good Aaron Rodgers is at at his age coming back from the Achilles. But you know, st- I would still slot them pretty much the same way. I, until I see differently, I'm going to believe in the Bills. I think that Sean McDermott, yeah, they lost some guys, especially at safety, but they believe in their system. It's a it, it, their defensive system is good. It's sound, uh, sort of bend but don't break type of thing. It works for them. It's always worked for Sean McDermott. They still have the best quarterback in the division. So, as of right now, I I I'm. As of right now, pending the draft and everything, I'm going Bills, Dolphins, Jets, and yes, Patriots last. I can't boost them up not knowing who the hell the quarterback is, the left tackle, or what they do at wide receiver. So until until I know otherwise, the Patriots are still in last with all the changes they've had this offseason. Agree with you at three and four. I would swap Buffalo and Miami. I do think Miami will take that step. They, they lost a couple of important people, though, right? I mean, Wilkins is gone. Hunt is gone. Uh, Xavier and Howard is gone, but they did bring in Kendall Fuller, so Fuller will replace Howard uh, at, at the cornerback slot. But I would go Miami just above Buffalo. Pretty tight, though. I, I don't think there's a huge difference between those two teams right, right now. Uh, before we get into some draft stuff, this just came across, caught my eye, Greg. Aaron Wilson reporting that uh, Miles Bryant's contract with Houston is one year, $1.75 million. 
ipso facto, wow. you were a Belichick guy and we didn't have interest in you coming back, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's disappointing for Miles. I think he's a better player than that, as we've um, talked about, especially just the versatility that he provides. But that, uh, yeah, that's woof. That's um, not very much, and obviously the Patriots did not want him back. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball tip off the month of April. Be part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. Prize Picks has something for every sports fan, from basketball and hockey to League of Legends and everything in between. You can pick LeBron, Caitlin Clark, Connor McDavid, and Jude Bellingham all in the same entry. Uh, I had just the other night, I had Caitlin Clark for more than 30 points oh. and LeBron James for more than seven three pointers, and I hit it. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code CLNS for the first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's a match up to $100 by using code CLNS. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy over at Price Picks. Let's jump to the draft, Mr. Bedard. Bruce Feldman came out with his mock draft, including some intel on these players. You can catch that at The Athletic. Let's start with Jaden Daniels at number two. Everybody knows that uh, Caleb Williams is going to one Chicago, so that's that's done, all set. So let's start at number two. He's got Jaden Daniels going there. And here's a quote from Feldman's story. Quote, I tell people this. Outside of Patrick Mahomes, I have not coached against someone like this. He's just very hard to defend. We try to force him to run to take it out of his hands. The throws he makes and the timing he has, I thought it was second to none. Yeah, this um, this pretty much, and and uh, let me just give a shout out to Bruce Feldman, who you know I've known for years. I think he he and Pete Thamel are sort of top notch on the college game, and are sort of my go to guys. They have a lot of deep sources. So this is from this is from a coach. These quotes are going to be from coaches that went against these players. And to me, this quote pretty much backs up what I think about Jaden Daniels and what I've heard from NFL people that he's just. He's just dynamic and special in terms of the problem he presents to a defense in terms of his deep throwing ability and his running ability. Both are now I'm not just I'm not saying that Jaden Daniels has the biggest arm in the world. He doesn't. But his ability to uh, throw from the pocket, um, not need much room uh, to operate in there and to deliver the ball down the field, plus his running ability. It's it's special. It's um, it's it's going to be. You know, and I heard from somebody who would know uh, that, you know, he's he's Lamar Jackson with better throwing ability. And that should scare a lot of people um, and it should excite the team that he goes to. I just think that Daniels is that special. And I think that that quote is uh, completely accurate. All right, let's jump to Drake May. Feldman has him going third to the Patriots. Got a couple of quotes. I'll ask you. Your thoughts on each quote when I read through them. The first one, quote, really good arm, love his pocket presence. His awareness of where all the rushers are, whether it was four, five, or six, was off the charts. It made him hard to pass rush. Any risk you took, he felt it and was able to expose you. He could make you pay on just about anything you do. He was really hard to deal with. I wouldn't say he's Trevor, speaking of Lawrence, but he's probably the best we've seen since Trevor. Yeah, that was probably the thing that jumped out to me the most in that quote was about his pocket presence and and having and so, uh, an innate ability to feel the rush. That's extremely important. I hadn't heard that before. Uh, I would say that the film, I, I think the film backs that up. Uh, again, most of my criticisms of Drake May aren't really the uh, his instincts and the way he plays. It's more just mechanical stuff and and it depends on how fixable you think that stuff is where it just leads to I mean he misses throws you're just like what the hell how do you yeah. miss that throw it's it's right there so but to me that quote about him being able to feel the rush definitely uh perked up my ears a little bit and I'm like well that is definitely a feather in his cap let's roll with the second quote I think he could be a better quarterback than Caleb Williams if you can protect him he throws the bleep out of it but the last two years, we could tell that he really doesn't like all that stuff around him. I thought Sam Howell was a tougher kid. Yeah, and he also said he gets a little bit scared back there, in my opinion. 
Um, this is the other side of the coin with Drake May and stuff that the the teams, especially the Patriots, are going to have to ferret out when they talk to him, when they do deep dives on him. Um, you know, you worry about uh, because you saw so much drifting and so much so many footwork problems last year when things weren't good around him and and everyone readily admits that from the offensive line to the receivers to the change in offensive philosophy um you this this is this gives you pause and it gives me pause and it's there on film and you you this is something the patriots are going to have to figure out and and if they don't have conviction on it then they need to bail on the pick and trade down or perhaps do something different uh with the next guy that we're going to talk about Let's talk about him. J.J. McCarthy, not one, not two, but three quotes on J.J. Let's hit the first one. Michigan coaches, Feldman wrote this, loved his leadership skills and his demeanor with one saying, quote, he doesn't have a bad day, and if he does, he doesn't let anybody know it, and that's the mark of a good leader. Feldman writes, even more impressive, coaches say, is his in- intellect and his understanding of coverage. After a drive, his coaches would ask what the coverages were, quote, and he'd be exactly right, unquote. Off the charts good in both areas and, and you know, really brings J.J. up a notch and, and it begins to make you understand why he's um, being talked about um, more and more. Um, you know, the leadership stuff, the, 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 uh, the ability to decipher coverages and know what he's doing, that's, those are all elite traits. And when you're talking about intangibles, and as we all know, that's sort of uh, the make or break thing when it comes to a quarterback in the NFL is, you know, what's what's under the hood, what's in the head, what's what's in the chest. And uh, with those two quotes, um, he's sort of off the charts good in, in those areas. Before I get to the second quote on McCarthy, I want to put GM Greg Bedard in the war room on draft night. If it's between elite traits, elite physical traits or elite intangibles, which way are you leaning? Great question, Nick. Um, now, I, I will say, I, I will say, first of all, it depends on how close they are with the intangibles. Um, how big of a drop off is it? Right. Um, you have to look in both areas. Like, you know, what's what are you giving? How how big? I mean, if it's a huge gap, then I'm probably going to the intangibles. Um, but uh, me, as of right now. Uh, especially with what the Patriots have gone through, what they went through with Mac Jones and some of the other quarterbacks that we see around the league, I'm deferring to elite traits as long as the intangibles isn't a huge drop-off or huge unknown. All right, quote number two on McCarthy from Bruce Feldman's story, his mock draft. Quote, I think too many people are getting caught up trying to look at box scores instead of watching film. He makes a lot of plays for them after the play breaks down. There's some wow stuff in there. He's on a dead sprint, and he makes some perfect throws. When he has to get out and make a play, he can really do it, unquote. Again, another um, elite comment that makes you uh, sort of sit up and be like, you know, this is good stuff. And now, you know, this quote is from an opponent. The first quote was from the Michigan coaches. Um, So, I mean, this is, again, this is – this kind of thinking and the stuff you do see, you do see some of this stuff on film. Um, it makes you think longer and harder about JJ McCarthy for sure. One more on McCarthy. I thought he was great. You could tell he was the alpha male on that team from a leadership standpoint. He was coached up well on how to make throws and make the decisions very fast. He throws very well on the run he did have a really good O line and a good defense, but we did not think their wide receivers were great, and he made it all go. Yeah, it, it, you know, sort of like um, the last checkoff, where you just like, you know, alpha male leadership led the team to a national championship. Um, it's all really good stuff, and it's going to make me, when I get into a little bit more into the JJ McCarthy film, look a little bit harder and sort of, you know, pick out. Um, try to try to decipher, you know, why the Michigan coaches made the decisions they did in terms of the offense. I still, I still have problems with a team when the coaches um, decide to be conservative with their quarterback, yeah. especially on third and medium, third and long. That's something that's 
hard to get past because coaches make decisions for a reason. And sometimes they took the ball out of McCarthy's hands and that has to be addressed. Maybe it was just because Harbaugh just played through the defense and we're just going to be conservative sort of Dave wants that. It's not a sin to punt type of thing, but um, all of those quotes uh, sort of make you sit up and be like, okay, this McCarthy stuff might be legit. I think it's all part of the uh, mosaic, so to speak, right? When you're evaluating a quarterback, and that's why it's so tough. N- nobody knows. <laughs> Greg can pour through the film, and, and we can get all of these quotes, good and bad, on all of these guys. The truth is nobody really knows. If if people knew how to evaluate quarterbacks flawlessly, then we'd, we'd see a lot more guys hitting than missing, right? So nobody truly knows when, when you take that next step what happens. And, and part of that, or, or pretty much – the biggest part, if not all of it, is because there's so much involved when you evaluate a quarterback. It's it's the leadership, it's the acumen, it's the toughness, it's the competitiveness, it's you know the accuracy in the pocket, out of the pocket. How is he from a mobility standpoint now in 2024 with with the athleticism jumping you know off the charts across the league? But just all of these things. How does he handle adversity? Like all. It is such a long list that you have to go through before you say yes or no on a quarterback. And that's why it's difficult because nobody's going to be all yeses unless you're Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck's like all yeses. All yeses, no question about that guy. Those are one in a million when you talk about quarterbacks. So you go through the list, and inevitably you're going to have some things that you're questioning. You've just got to be confident. And the idea that the things that you did check off will outweigh the ones that you didn't check off. It's it's a math problem. It's an inexact science. It's very difficult. So I do not envy any of these guys that are making this decision three weeks from today on April 25th on who to pick in the top three, top five, first round when it comes to the quarterback. All right. Before we get to uh, some mailbag questions, want to remind you, episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. You can download the app today. Use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. And as we head to those BSJ mailbag questions, don't forget, you can join Boston Sports Journal. 50 bucks for the year. Bedard, Giardi tag teaming the football coverage. Corrales getting ready for the Celtics postseason run. Haggerty getting ready for the Bruins postseason run. So a lot happening right now. Red Sox off to a 5-2 start. Not too excited. Let's pump the brakes. It was Seattle and Oakland, <laughs> but they're five and two. So at least they're not two and five. It could be worse. All right, let's jump into the uh, the mailbag questions, Greg. Here is one from Jay Thompson. What receivers do you think the Patriots should be interested in drafting? So I haven't done my deep dive uh, on the wide receivers yet. I will do deep. Uh, I will do deep dives, or at least give you my opinions by the time we get to the draft on quarterback, offensive tackle, and wide receiver. But in terms of guys that I've seen so far that uh, I am intrigued by, um, that may or may not be available sometime by the where the Patriots pick in the second round, uh, Brian Thomas, Ladd McConkey, Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, Keon Coleman, Xavier Leggett, and Malachi Corley, the Western Kentucky sort of Debo Samuel guy, one guy you will not see on my list. And again, I, I haven't watched film on him, but just what I saw out of him at the combine workout, AD, AD Mitchell off my list. Oh. Now. now I could be, I could be completely biased and uh, I could be completely wrong. It, uh, but I thought he was horrendous in the positional drills during uh, the combine. And so I'm out. I love him. I love AD Mitchell. And I know there, I know there's questions. There's questions about the motor. There's questions about some of the things at the combine, like Greg said. But freak athlete, uh, the guy, when when he is engaged, he is a freak on the football field. He can make plays. You want to talk about fade routes? Not not the biggest fan. I was watching uh, Nate Tice with Mina Kimes the other day, and uh, Nate Tice said this, and I agree with him. Like not a not a fan of fade routes in, in the red zone. I hate it. I, I hate I hate mm-hmm. the fade, but. If you're going to throw a fade to a dude, A.D. Mitchell's that dude. He makes plays on the football on those fade routes in the corner of the end zone. He he is so talented, but there is question about mentality, approach, some of those things. Um, Keon Coleman's very polarizing. I, I love him, uh, but 
I also understand the other side of it, which is he'll remind some people of Nikhil Harry at times. He's a he's a big receiver, contested catch guy. He did not run a good forty, but then you know his his GPS, you know speed at the combine was over twenty miles an hour. So people will tell you he plays fast, and there's a question of whether or not. The quarterback play affected him at Florida State at times. The lack of accuracy on deep balls could have hurt him and his ability. Uh, he started off the season like a house of fire, and he really faded. He's a very polarizing guy. He's a guy that could go like in the top 25, more so 20 to 25, or he could slide down into like the second round, early to mid-second round. He, he's that polarizing of a guy. Xavier Leggett is, is just a beast. His body reminds me of A.J. Brown. I'm not telling you he's A.J. Yeah. Brown. But his his frame, when you see him play at times, it'll remind you of AJ. All right, let's get to uh, DC Lapidus. All right, Greg, you've reviewed the roster, and Elliot Wolf has delegated you with the responsibility for the draft. If the draft breaks perfectly for you, please tell us which positions you are using the eight picks on. And by the way, uh, Lapidus throws his picks into the mix. He says he would go two quarterbacks. Two receivers, two tackles, one tight end, and one defensive lineman. Greg, take it from here. So um, I, I'm going to do this provided that there's no trade downs. Um, if the Patriots do not trade out of three, I would be on high alert for the Patriots trading out of 34 and trying to get as many picks as possible. That's sort of like a Ron Wolf thing. Mm. But provided they stick. Pick three, quarterback. Pick 34, Offensive tackle or wide receiver, who's ever higher on the board. And then with 68, I'm doing the I'm doing the opposite. So if they take a wide receiver at 34, which might be higher on the board, if somebody's there, like say a Brian Thomas slips into the second round, I'm grabbing Brian Thomas. Then I'm going OT in the third round. I'm going tight end, and I'm pretty close with DC Lapidus in terms of positions. I'm going tight end in the fourth round. I'm going wide receiver again in the fifth round. I'm hoping that a quarterback like possibly a Jordan Travis, who's coming off a really serious injury at FSU, yep. is there in the sixth round to sort of mine and, you know, a lottery pick. And wh remember, what I've heard about this draft is once you get to day three, it's a crap show because of NIL, <laughs> um, COVID years, people staying in school, like a lot, um, a lot fewer underclassmen declared this year. So the third day in the draft, is just bad, and either you're trading maybe into next year or you're basically just uh, getting your uh, undrafted free agency going early. So uh, first pick in the sixth-round quarterback, second pick in the sixth round from Jacksonville, a DT, uh, hopefully some sort of uh, nose tackle uh, without Lawrence Guy and you know Devon Godshaw. He's not going to be here forever. And then the seventh round, um, a running back, letting Alonzo Highsmith sort of uh, – have his pick sixth round quarterback. I know a lot of people have been talking about this guy. A lot of people love him. I have one reason why I wouldn't mind it. Joe Milton, because if you do Whoa. draft, if you draft Drake may, I want to be at camp and just watch may versus Milton throw bombs, 75 yards <laughs> down the field bombs <clears throat> off, off like on the knees. How far can they throw one knee, both knees, yep. Just give me a throwing contest between those two guys. Let them uncork a couple of missiles at Foxborough. I'd love it. I think right. I think it moved. I think it moved for Nick <laughs> if that happened. Oh, no. <laughs> give me the bombs. All right. Uh C Moniz. Greg, to me, JJ McCarthy is Alex Smith reincarnated. I know where you stand with the quarterbacks, but what is the allure of grabbing a quarterback who has had little to no adversity and virtually nothing on tape? where he was really down in a big game and had to come back. Let me just say this before I move forward. There was somebody who listens to the podcast, and this guy, he wanted to battle on Twitter with me about the adversity question with J.J. McCarthy. I don't know if he's a Michigan mm -hmm. fan or not, but my man, he was ready to die on that hill. So shout out to him. I don't quite remember his name. I'm sorry. But shout out to you, <laughs> McCarthy guy, because – you will forever live in my brain. You you are ready. All right. So to continue, Simonis. Very few, if any, times did he do that. Talking about McCarthy, uh, you know, down in a big game and, and had to come back. That to me is a, ra a major red flag. Hmm. Um. You know, I I sort of view this as a uh, 
you know, when we get into the Patriots and we're like, the Patriots are eight. No, they haven't played anybody like you're going to penalty, you know, Patriots fans was like, we're just playing the schedule. We're just, you know, why you got to be so mean? Um, I think this is similar. All right, so he was on a good team with a really good coach and a really good defense. Um, I, you know, I, I, from what I saw, and again, I don't watch a lot of college football. I haven't done a deep dive on McCarthy, but I just know, um, you know, in the playoffs, especially the national championship game, he had to make there. There were plays he had to make, and he made them. Uh, really big plays in the game, and so, um, well, I mean. You know, you could say that, but then, you know, you look at Drake May and, you know, got to 6-0 and this year, beating up some cupcakes. And then when the going got tough, did he raise everybody around him? I, I don't think you could say that either. I, I understand. It is a red flag. It's something that the teams have to work out. But um, judging off the quotes that we said earlier in the podcast, there's a, there's a lot of things to like about J.J. McCarthy. I don't like I, I don't know how you feel about it, Nick. I don't love the Alex Smith comparison. I Thinking back to Alex Smith coming out of Utah, first of all, he came out of sort of like a uh, that Urban Meyer offense, um, you know, option, uh, RPO type of thing. And I never thought Alex Smith was very uh, athletic in terms of throws off platforms and things like that. To me, he was a lot more robotic. I don't see McCarthy that way. I think that McCarthy is a much better athlete, has played more in a pro-style offense, and does a lot more things than Alex Smith did coming out of Utah. Honestly, I wasn't watching a lot of college football when Alex Smith was was playing at Utah. So yeah. I, I will uh, plead the fifth. One, two, three, four, fifth. And I'll let Greg answer that. Think, think, think the Tebow Florida offense. It was the same thing. It was Urban okay. Meyer. Okay. All right, let's go to uh, K Chen 80. Final question of the day. Hey, Greg. How much has the poor drafting, including Tyquan Thornton, hurt Matt Grow? Are you aware of any of, quote-unquote, his picks that have popped where he still has a meaningful say in who he gets who gets drafted, or is he just doing the legwork and the picks come down to Wolf and Alonzo Heisman? I think this, this kind of stuff is a little bit overrated and a little talk radio-ish. Um, you know, the bottom line was um, Bill Belichick – approved the picks. He made the picks. Mm -hmm. And you can listen to people talk about like, oh, well, Kraft made him draft Mac Jones. Bill Belichick didn't want to draft Mac Jones. That's a bunch of bull crap. Nobody who was in the building who's who was around that team has ever told me anything like that. And if you if you want to use it as an excuse for and I think a lot of people try to use it as an excuse for Bill Belichick on why he should keep his job about how it wasn't his fault. To me, it was complete BS. Yes, Matt Dro Matt Rowe was director of college scouting. But at the end of the day, still, Bill, up until the very end, was still, you know, making the picks. He approved the picks. Um, and, and do I think he went with Matt Rowe on this? Yeah. I also think that Matt Rowe, at least judging off of Matt Rowe's reaction in the press box at times, especially when Marcus Jones won the Jets game with a punt return, uh, that might be, quote-unquote, one of his picks. Now, in some ways, it's paid off. Other ways, it hasn't in terms of injuries. But I think that all that stuff's overrated. I just think that when it came time to it, I think that the Crafts went to Mayo and said, who do you want as your personnel guy if the time should come? And he said Elliot Wolf, someone who – Mayo said that he basically from like day one struck up a great personal relationship with yep. Elliot has the experience and all that stuff. I, 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 so at the end of the day, do I think grow is going to be here long-term? It's possible. Kraft mentioned him at the league meetings, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's Elliot Wolf running the show with Alonzo Highsmith, but Macro's definitely involved. I wouldn't get it all, all excited and into who was his picks and things like that. That's a, that's a Jim Murray talk radio thing. It's up to the guy who calls the shot. You know, I mean, everybody's going to have their little binkies for certain reasons. I have my favorite players in this draft. Greg will have his favorite players in the draft. And, and you will go up to the person who's making the final call. Last year was Belichick. This year it's Elliot Wolf. And you will fight for your guy and say, this is why I love this dude. This is why I like him. But inevitably, 
the pick is whoever, you know, makes the pick and makes that decision. So Bill Belichick, it's not as if Matt Groh put a gun to his head and, and told him, pick Tyquan Thornton. You know, he told right. him, he told him what he liked about the guy and Bill made the decision. So that's how it works. And, and so you'll have a more collaborative process this year in this front office, reportedly. You'll have more voices involved, but it's going to be Elliot Wolf. It's Elliot Wolf's draft. And so he will make the final call. Hit the record will be his record. It won't be, oh, Cam Williams like this guy in the fifth round and he worked out. Oh, you know, this guy was a Pat Stewart player. This guy was an Alonzo Highsmith player. It's not how it works. Everybody has a voice. Wolf makes the call. I'm going to make the call. And I'm saying we're done with this pod today. We'll be back early next week. He's Greg. I'm Nick. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.